We are in Psalms chapter 17 tonight. Title for tonight's message is Bold Prayers Through Bad Circumstances. I don't know about you, but it's been uh, it's been an exciting adventure so far going through the Psalms this summer. You could say it's the summer of Psalms. Pretty catchy right there. But consider this. Proverbs tells us that every word of God proves true. And that 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all scripture is inspired by God. It is breathed by God. It's useful for teaching, reproof, correction, and for training in righteousness. And so when we go over this tonight, consider that this text is sacred. It has been handed down generation after generation, thousands of years old, multiple manuscripts preserved for me and you to feast upon tonight. And so I hope that tonight you can see in this prayer of David some confidence that he has when he goes before the Lord, because this is a prayer of boldness. It's a prayer of confidence that when we come before God, we can Enter into his throne of grace with confidence because of what Jesus Christ did for us. This prayer can actually be broken down into four different ways. Verses 1 through 5 tells us bold prayer comes from a faithful life. Verses 6 through 8 will tell us confident prayers are produced from a humble dependence upon God. Verses 9 through 12 will show us that confident prayers come when we give the problem to God. Amen? And then verses 13 through 15, boldness in prayer results from a confidence in God's salvation. And so, a little bit of a backdrop about this prayer. We don't know the exact timing. It is a prayer of David. We don't know the exact timing of it. We don't know the exact context of it. Um, most commentators, preachers, they think that it is most likely when Saul was chasing him. And I, th I think we might can come to that conclusion, but we don't know. We just don't know. But it might say in your, in your Bible, maybe like a prayer for protection against oppressors. That is what the NASB says. So with that being said, let's dive into verse 1 of Psalms 17, and we'll see in these first five verses, David's confident prayer comes from living a faithful life. He says in verse 1, Hear a just cause, O Lord. Give heed to my cry. Give ear to my prayer, which is not from deceitful lips. And so David, the man after God's own heart, has this passion in his soul, not only to hear from God, but that God would hear him. That's this prayer, for God to hear him. Notice what it says. Hear a just cause. Give heed to my cry. Give ear to my prayer. He is practically begging God to listen. That phrase there where he says, hear a just cause, that David is approaching God because he believes that whatever is going on, at that current moment, that he is just in what he is saying, that he is right in what he's doing. And that is natural, is it not? Let's say two people clash. Both parties are going to think that they're right. You think you're just, you think you're right. You think, no. As a matter of fact, Proverbs 21.2 tells us every man's way is right in his own eyes. Oh boy. But the Lord weighs the hearts. David also says, give heed to my cry. And translated in the ancient Hebrew, it is a loud cry. It is a loud cry of despair or joy. And when you think about that human emotion, I would argue it is the most natural of all human emotions. For those of you who have had kids, what is the first thing that happens? They cry. They cry. And so, and so David, so just as... Just as, as a father myself, raising a kid, when, when your child cries out, what is it, what is it calls you to do when, you're, when your child is crying, when your child is asking for something, begging for something? It causes you to 
turn your ear towards. Why? Because you love that child. David is calling for this right here. Lord, give heed to my cry. And, and David is quite literally like tears in his, in his eyes crying out to Lord for this circumstance, this bad circumstance that he is in. And I just thought as a side note, you've heard it said, real men don't cry. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that, by the way. Uh, David was a man of many tears, and so were a lot of other manly men in the Scriptures. I, I actually think it's very therapeutic for a good outpouring every now and then. So David was a man's man. He was a strong leader, the icon in the Judeo-Christian faith. And we see here he's pouring out his heart to God. Give heed to my cry. But he says there, Give ear to my prayer, which is not from deceitful lips. David is displaying, Lord, I've been faithful to you. In this circumstance, in my life, I've been faithful to you. He's saying, Lord, listen to my prayer, please. I am telling you the gospel truth. Verse 2, he says, let my judgment come forth from your presence. Let your eyes look with equity. That phrase there, let my judgment come forth from your presence, ultimately, David is saying, I think I am right. I think I am just in my cause, but God, ultimately, this has to come from you. I like the English Standard Version of verse 2. It reads as follows. From your presence, let my vindication come. Let your eyes behold the right. He felt as though his cause was just, that he was in the right. But ultimately, David was committing this to God, saying, Lord, I need you to vindicate me. I feel like I am right, but you are the ultimate one who deems what is right and wrong. He is asking God to prove him to be right. And, and David, I mean, if, if it be the case that he's being chased by Saul, he certainly had the right. He certainly had the power to take things into his own hands. He was being unjustly persecuted, pursued. But yet he's saying, Lord, this is in your hands. Committing his problem to the Lord. Perhaps David understood what it meant in Deuteronomy 32, 35, where it says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. In due time their foot will slip. It's a promise. For the day of their calamity is near, and the impending things are hastening upon them. And so, my question for you, as we've gone through the Psalms this summer, again, where do you see Jesus in the Psalms? I got a few here, but you probably will see more. Where do we see Christ? Because the whole canon of Scripture points to the Lord Jesus Christ. David says, God, you vindicate me. Was, was there someone else who was vindicated on the cross? Yes. Jesus Christ, hunted, mocked, persecuted, chased after, attempted to be thrown off a cliff. Attempted to be stoned to death, beaten to the point of death, and hung on a cross. Yet he was vindicated. Praise God, hallelujah, he was vindicated. When that stone rolled away and he rose from the grave, he was vindicated by his enemies who wanted to assassinate him and oppress him. Hallelujah to that. God showed the world that Jesus Christ is indeed the God-man who triumphed over the grave when he rose. David says, he says, let your eyes, God, let your eyes look on this with equity. The ESV says, let your eyes behold what is right. The New King James says, let your eyes look on that which is upright. He is again calling on God, look down on what is right. Show me, Lord, that this is Indeed, right. And so when the great judge, Yahweh, puts this matter on the scales, he is asking God, don't judge. God doesn't judge. He is not showing any partiality. He is not showing any favoritism. And David recognizes that, and he is asking God to do so. So David has confidence and boldness that he is in the right 
before God in this matter at hand. Now look at verse 3. This gets interesting. David says, you've tried my heart. You visited me by night. You've tested me and found nothing. I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. He says, you've tried my heart. David knows that God knows his heart. That's clear. He is confident, David, in this current circumstance, he is confident that God knows that his motives are right. And we know that God sees our motives. He sees the heart of man. David writes in Psalms 139, verse 13, For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. So for this right here, David didn't have any condemnation. He didn't have any conviction. David had confidence that his cause was right. It was just and it was true. 1 John 3.21, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn it, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. But Jesus even said in Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. David says, Lord, you have visited me by night. What does he mean by that? Well, consider what's going on at night. What's going on at home when you're laying in the bed? You're home alone, free from distractions, free from the busyness, the heavy responsibilities of life, free from the eyes of others. And so even in the secret place, David says, even when nobody is around, Lord, I have honored you. And that's integrity, my friends, is it not? Doing the right thing when nobody is watching. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 6, But you, when you pray, go to your inner room, close the door, pray to your Father in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. He says, Lord, you have tested me and found nothing. Okay, now at this point, I was, and you might be scratching your head going, wait, hold up. This sounds crazy. We know the dirt on David. We know the dirt. Is David on some type of self-righteous trip here? Like he've, he's reached, he has arrived, reached some level of sinless perfection? <laughs> no, of course not. Throughout the Psalms, David recognized that his righteousness, his goodness came from Yahweh. But in this circumstance, David knew that he was right in his just cause. He had a clear conscience. And that is one of the great things in walking with the Lord and doing the best we can to live the right life, to live a godly life, living with a clear conscience. David was no stranger to being tested by God, no way. Matter of fact, David prayed this several times. For example... Psalms 26, 2. Examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and my heart. Psalms 139, very famous one. 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any harmful way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Have you ever prayed that? Are you scared to pray it? But again, looking for Jesus. Was Jesus tested? Was Jesus tempted? Yes, absolutely. He was tested, tempted, and tried in every way, yet without sin. David says, I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. That word to, to purpose your mouth means to set your intention on not using foul language. David purposed that his mouth will not transgress. He will not sin against God, just like Job. So David had his intentions set firmly on not transgressing the Lord with his mouth. James even says it's a whole world of poison, and we need to set our intentions 
on not having a foul mouth. Here's a good reference. Colossians 3 verse 2 tells us to set our mind, set our attentions on things above, not on things of this earth. Verse 4. Verse 4, David says, As for the deeds of men, by the words of your lips, I have kept from the paths of the violent. He says, by the word of your lips, literally by the word of God, David, by the word of God, has kept him from the path of violence. And that can be taken in two ways, meaning he has stayed away from the evildoers. Or it could also mean that he has not gotten pulled into the violence against the one who's opposing him. So by the word of God, it has preserved him and protected him from engaging in violence and also protecting him from violence. I like what the New King James says for verse 4. Concerning the works of men, by the word of your lips, I have kept away from the paths of the destroyer. Now, we may not have, I, I don't think we any in here have anybody who is violently chasing us. In other countries, we don't think about this enough or pray about it enough. But in other countries, Christians are persecuted, they are hunted down, they are locked in dungeons and killed. But here in America, we face less persecution, but we do have a destroyer who is after your mind and soul. The enemy, the forces of darkness. The Bible is real clear, John 10.10. 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He is the destroyer. In Revelation, he is called the destroyer, Abaddon. And so, my friends, as the return of Christ draws nearer and nearer, I don't know if you've noticed, but we, we, we see how this veil between the seen and unseen realm is growing thinner and th thinner, and how the schemes and strategies of the, the enemy, the darkness, which used to work in, in they, they used to work covertly, uh, it, subversive. In the darkness, but now we're in an age where evil is just abroad. They are overt with their tactics. They proudly boast about the evil these days. So that's just another confirmation that we are just getting a little closer and closer to the Lord Jesus coming back. So thousands of years ago, David kept himself from the path of the destroyer by holding firm to the word of God. And fast forward to the present day, the right here, the right now. Same for us, y'all. Ephesians 6, it tells us, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Oh no, we wrestle against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers over this present darkness. Against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And Paul says, put on the armor of God. Take up. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Amen. I like what Paul also says in, in 2 Corinthians 10.4. The weapons, plural, weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. In the staff meeting this morning, we were listening to a video of Johnny Corson, if you're familiar with him. Love that guy. And he was talking about one of our weapons is worship. We have access to incredible spiritual weapons that can deter, throw off, and just make the enemy cringe. Man, you bust into some worship, I'm pretty sure those forces of evil are going to go the other way because that is an energy they don't want to be around. In verse 5, um, David says, he says, My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. He's saying, Lord, I have stayed the course. I have not gone astray from the path you have laid out before me. In the New Testament, Paul said that the Corinthians, he said, hold fast to the word that I have preached to you. To the Philippians, he tells them, hold fast to the word of life. To Timothy, 
In 2 Timothy 4, 7, he says, I've fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And so David declares here in these first few lines of this of this prayer that he has been faithful to the Lord in this matter, in this circumstance, this bad situation that he's gotten himself into, whether it be Saul chasing him, he has remained faithful in it. So he comes to God with a confident prayer found in his faithfulness to the Lord. And the same is true today, my friends. Hebrews, Hebrews mentions several times about how we have boldness. We have confidence in Christ that we can come before God's throne and find help. We can receive grace and mercy to help us in our time of need. David said, Lord, I've done your will. I have stayed the course. I have fought the good fight. And again, looking for Jesus. Jesus perfectly did the will of the Father. John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now, switching gears, verses 6 through 8 is going to show us how, how these bold prayers can come from a humble dependence upon God. Verse 6, David says, I have called upon you. For you will answer me, O God, incline your ear to me, hear my speech. Now that's in the past tense. He says, I've called upon you. He's he's looking back. He's saying, Lord, I have called upon you. I know you have answered in the past. I know you will answer me again. David has a confidence that God has answered him back then. And he knows that God is going to answer him now. Psalms 145, 18. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. So for those, me and you, who have experienced the faithfulness of God in times of need, we will have a greater confidence in that next thing that we run up against. It's almost like we experience confidence We have an assurance that God has helped us in these things in the past and that equips us, it strengthens us to be able to face the things in front of us. 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15. This is the confidence that we have before him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, We know we have the requests which we have asked from him. Verse 7, he says, Wondrously show your loving kindness, O Savior, of those who take refuge at your right hand, from those who rise up against them. So David shows us in this prayer, his dependence is also on God's steadfast love. This is an important word. The NAS calls it loving kindness. The English Standard Version calls it steadfast love. In the Hebrew, the word is hesed. And it's a unique, special word. It it, it speaks of this intimate love that God expresses consistently towards his children. It's a covenant love. It's a covenant love. It's an unwavering love. It's an unchanging, unfailing love that God displays towards his kids. It's a love that a father displays towards his child. I didn't have time to go look in the lexicon, but I would say this is agape love. The steadfast love of Lord God Almighty. David says, God, show it to me. Show me your steadfast love. I am depending upon your love. That same word is also found in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. Pretty famous verse. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. 
His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And this is, I just find this so interesting because in going through this, it almost seems to me like David is arguing his case before God. Like he's coming into the throne room of heaven and he's holding God to his own word. He's saying, Lord, I need your love. I am holding you to your love. And y'all, we have that confidence because the promises of God are yes and amen. And we can approach the throne room of God with confidence that he is true to his word. He says, O Savior of those who take refuge at your right hand. David calls God his Savior, his Deliverer, the one who rescues him. He is the God who saves. And that is the essence of the whole Bible. It is about a God who saves. Amen? That's right. He talks about the right hand of God that speaks of strength, the strengths of power. God is mighty and powerful to save those who run to God for strength. Those who run to God as a source of power, not of themselves, but will experience that power of Yahweh who saves his children. Look at verse 8. This is pretty cool. He says, keep me as the apple of the eye. Some translations say, keep me as the apple of your eye. I can't see where there's actually a possessive pronoun in there. But we're just going to run with this. He says, keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Do you see the dependence there? David's dependence upon God. He has a confident dependence upon God in his prayers. He says, keep me. Hide me. Lord, keep me. Lord, sustain me. Lord, preserve me. These are action words. He's asking for God to move. On his behalf. Now at first, it, when you read that, keep me as the apple of your eye. Kind of look at that and it's like, that seems a little egotistical. Like, Dave, does he think he's something special to God? Something unique? Actually, it's not quite what it means. We have that phrase today, and it does mean that in our culture. But back then, it is literally talking about the eye. The pupil of the eye. Proverbs 7, 2, chapter 7, verse 2. Keep my commandments and live, and my teaching as the apple of your eye. And so this is a reference to the eyes, to the pupil of the eye. And consider, consider the eye and, and things about it. What are some things about the eye? It's very sensitive, is it not? It's very sensitive. It can be hurt very easily. So Lord, keep me sensitive to your Holy Spirit. The eye is very fragile. It needs protection. I do construction, and it is very dangerous for me to do certain things without eye protection because you get a piece of metal or concrete dust in there, and it's a trip to the ER. The eye is very fragile. It needs protection. So, so Lord, keep me close to you. David's saying, Lord, keep me close to you. I need your protection. I need you. I am fragile. I am sensitive. God, I need your protection. And of course, we know the eye is very valuable for all the obvious reasons. And indeed, every child of God is valued in his eyes. But Jesus had something to say about the eye. In Matthew 6, verses 22 and 23. Jesus says the eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great that darkness. Also, David says, hide me. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. What does that mean? It speaks of protection in the wings, as, as a, a, a mother hen would protect her chickens underneath her wings. David is saying, Lord, I need your protection. Hide me under your wings. It's also a way of provision, providing for, comforting. It's a demonstration of love and comfort. 
Psalms 91, verses 1 and 2. I love this one. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And so we see how David's confident prayers come from a humble dependence upon God Almighty. Now, verses 9 through 12, we can see how David also has confidence in his prayers because he's presenting the whole of his problem before the Lord. Verse 9, it says, From the wicked who spoil me, my deadly enemies surround me. And that's bouncing off of verse 8 where he says, Hide me. Hide me. God, hide me from the evil ones who oppress me. God, hide me from the darkness that is trying to steal my soul. God, hide me because I am surrounded by the enemy. Verse 10, he says, They've closed their unfeeling hearts. With their mouth, they speak proudly. So these evildoers, their hearts are callous. They're apathetic. They have no emotion. Now, we see a lot of that today. And they speak with arrogance. Is that what the enemy does in our lives? The blasphemies that are whispered in your ear, the untruths, the lies, the manipulations of the enemy comes against you? David says, they've surrounded us in our steps. Verse 11, they have now surrounded us in our steps. And by the way, I think he's talking about Saul because he says they've surrounded us in our steps. They set their eyes to cast us down to the ground. So David feels trapped. You ever felt trapped? You ever felt surrounded in your walk? The forces of evil waging war against you. He says they set their eyes to cast us down to the ground. Meaning, they're looking for an opportunity to take you down. Sound familiar? Well, read verse 12 and it might ring a bell. It says he's like a lion that is eager to tear. And a young lion lurking in hiding places. Now, for some of y'all, that set off a bell. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Doing what? Seeking someone to devour. David gets it. And we get it. The enemy is fierce, y'all. He, he, he has power. Make no mistake about it. Just think about when, so when uh, Jesus was tempted... And, and, and he took him up to the top of the mountain, and, and the enemy showed him all the lands, and he said, this is mine, and I can give it all to you. I read that, and I go, this dude's a little more powerful than we think. And we don't have to look too far in today's culture and the influence in today's culture to understand that the forces of evil are at large. The destroyer, as we talked about earlier, often works in deceptive and hidden ways. Like David is saying here, wants to catch us off guard, to catch you by surprise. He might be like that lion lurking in these hiding places. But I just couldn't help but to thank y'all. Jesus Christ, the Lion of Judah, as it says in Revelation, the one who defeated him on the cross. Crushed, disarmed, as the scripture says. He disarmed the principalities and powers by the death on the cross. And so you, me, when you feel, when you're going through that season, when you feel like the enemy has surrounded you, where they're looking for opportunities to take you down, we need to pick up that spiritual toolkit. Use those spiritual weapons which God has equipped us with and throw them back at the enemy. Again, worship the word, scripture. The word of God is the greatest weapon that we have, my friends. My question to you tonight, what arrows do you have in your quiver? What scripture do you have memorized? 
The weapons of our warfare are not fleshly. They are supernatural. They are divinely powerful for the destruction of the enemy. Some of mine are that I use, for example, Isaiah 54, 17 says, No weapon formed against you shall prosper. We declare these things in the face of the enemy. Or 1 John 4, 4, Greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. Romans 8, 37, this is a great one. We are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. So again, let's be storing up these weapons, these arrows in our quiver, so that when the enemy comes against us, when that lion who is lurking in those hiding places tries to rear his ugly head out, you can pull that thing out and take him out by the word of God. Amen. Amen. So, again, uh, David's boldness, it came from taking his problem, and it seemed like a pretty dire situation, honestly, but rather than trying to fix it himself, which is what we often try to do, you know, men, we're fixers, we like to fix things, take things in our own hands. David, he's committing it all to the Lord. Lord, you fight my battles. And today, y'all, we stand in the place of victory. We don't stand in the place of defeat. We stand in the place of victory because of the victory that took place on the cross. So verses 13 to the end. David's boldness comes from a confidence in God's deliverance. Verse 13. And look at verse 13 because I couldn't help but to notice the language of a divine warrior. We have a heavenly, divine warrior who fights on our behalf. He says, arise, O Lord. David calls for God to move. He says, arise, O Lord. Confront him. Bring him low. Deliver my soul from the wicked with your sword. David is calling on God to move. And actually, six times in the Psalms, you can see the phrase, arise, O Lord. It was covered, David uh, mentioned it back in Psalms chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. He said, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have smitten my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. David says, Lord, confront him. Bring him low. Literally translated, cast him down. Some translations say, subdue the enemy, overthrow the enemy. David is praying for div divine deliverance from our heavenly warrior. He says, deliver my soul from the wicked with your sword. David has recognized God as the one he runs to for help. David employs God to go on the offense to take down and take out his enemies. And my friends, at the end of history, in the consummation of all things, when Jesus Christ returns with the saints, he too is going to come with a sword. Revelation 19, 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it, he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. Verse 14, it says, From men with your hand, deliver me from men with your hand, O Lord, from men of the world whose portion is in this life and whose belly you fill with your treasure. They are satisfied with children and leave their abundance to their babes. So David continues here his appeal to God for him to deliver him from his enemy, but he's also pointing out a little bit of the MO of the enemy, of how they operate, why they do what they do, who they are. But it's interesting in this verse 14, he just previously said, Lord, come down and strike them with the sword. But here he says, do it with your hand. In either way, we're talking about the power of God. David is calling upon the power of God. God doesn't need a weapon to strike down the enemy. 
David knows a full understanding about the power of the Almighty. Just for example, he wrote Psalms 19. The heavens are de declaring, the heavens are telling the glory of God. Their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. So David understood that Yahweh, that he spun the universe into existence by his very hand. So he's calling on God to use his mighty hand to deliver him from his enemy. And he's basically saying here in this verse that these people, they don't care about spiritual matters. They don't live to please God. They live to please the flesh. That's what it says here when it says, whose portion is in this life. And that kind of sums up the theology of earth people. They get their fill in this life. They only care about what this world has to offer them. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, verse 19, he says, Their end is destruction. Their God is in their belly. And their glory is in their shame with their mind set on earthly things. David says, actually in Psalms 119, verse 57, The Lord is my portion. I have promised to keep your words. So what does that mean? The Lord is my portion. Oh, in the Hebrew, that word portion speaks of inheritance. It speaks of, it speaks of possession. It can even speak of sharing in the booty, sharing in the, the possessions that you have gathered. So the Lord is my inheritance. The Lord is everything that I need. Take notice to what Jesus said in chapter 6. He said, when you give... When you pray, when you fast, don't do it like the hypocrites do who stand in the synagogues and on the street corners. Jesus said, they have their reward in full. They're, they're getting their fill. They're getting their fill of earthly things. But rather, Matthew 6 is so good. Rather, Jesus said in Matthew 6, verses 19 and 21, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves come in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where the thieves can't break in and steal. Here's the kicker. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Last verse, David says, As for me... Uh, like contrast, contrast to the earth people. In contrast for those who live strictly for the flesh, David says, as for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. So in contrast to those who are worldly minded, David rests his satisfaction in God alone. Psalm 1611, you will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And so in the, in the here and now, we can get this satisfaction. We can get this pleasure. We can, we can be satisfied in God. In the here and now, Jesus said in Matthew 5 verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. In John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me, he will never hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. See, every human being, it says in Ecclesiastes, that God has set eternity in the heart of man. God has created humans to worship him. They are his, divine, they are his creation to worship and dwell with him forever. So there is this innate part of every human that people try to worship. And everybody 
on this planet does worship in some form. In some form. It can be vices. It can be sports. It can be fishing. Fill in the blank. David says, my satisfaction comes from you. My satisfaction is in Yahweh. He says, when I awake, and that is a key phrase at the very end there, I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. And it seems here that he is pointing to the eternal, pointing to the afterlife. David knew that when he passed from death to life, it was just like waking up. Because to be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. I would argue that the heavenly reality is more real than this thing we're stuck in right now. It's eternal. This world we live in will one day perish. David knew death was like a doorway to the eternal. He says, I will behold your face. I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be eternally satisfied with your likeness. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are children of God. And it has not appeared as what we will be. We know, we know that when he appears, we will be like him. Because we will see him just as he is. I long for that day, family. Amen. So in closing, what, what, what can we take home from this? From this prayer, how can we have confidence, boldness in our prayers before the Almighty? Strive to live a faithful and righteous life. The effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. Or Psalm 66, 18, David says, If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord's not going to hear. So my friends, like David has laid out, let's strive to live, not perfect, but strive for that faithful and righteous life. Also, David demonstrated here how we should have a humble dependence upon God. To, to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. David also, he committed his problem to the Lord. He said, Lord, you, do, you deal with it. You fight my battles. Paul says in Philippians 4, 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And lastly, David showed us that we can have an abiding trust. We can have boldness. We can have confidence in our prayers knowing that we have a God who saves. Amen.